I'm Randy Oxier. I'm the co-director and co-founder of the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought. I see that we are joined by my other co-founders. Uh, well, one of them at least, John Shook, is on the line this time. Um, I want to say a word about what this particular uh, lecture series is. Uh, the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity, affiliated with uh, our institute some years ago. Uh, but before our institute even existed, the foundation decided that we wanted to dedicate a, uh, a regular lecture to one of the, you know, the grand gentlemen of the history of American philosophy, Lewis Edwin Hahn, who was my colleague here at SIU Carbondale and uh, was the secretary of the Society for the Philosophy of Creativity Central Division and the foundation. I think from about 1957 until 2000, uh, he was also the editor of the Library of Living Philosophers uh, from uh, 1981 until 2001 uh, and was really a wonderful mentor to so many people and a great servant of the profession. And so I think it was about eight years ago now that we began to do a summer lecture series. Three years ago, the foundation in cooperation with AIPCT decided that what we really wanted to do was to honor our Han lecturers by having someone who's relatively early career, somebody who's uh, mid-career, uh, 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 give papers on the work and the achievement of our central Han lecturer. As most of you know, the Han lecturer this year is uh, Lewis Gordon. And so we begin now our series of papers on Lewis Gordon. So in a minute here, Dwayne Tunstall, uh, who Corey is going to introduce, Dwayne Tunstall will give a paper. And then at four o'clock, Marilyn Nassim Sabat is going to give a paper. And um, these are uh, assessments of the important ideas and, uh, 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 and the relevance of Lewis Gordon's work, which uh, I'm sure most of you uh, know and have read. In any case, um, that said, I'll moderate the Q&A and this time it should work um, because I think I've got my audio pro problems fixed here. And so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Corey McCall who is the executive director of the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity and he's gonna introduce our speaker. Thanks Randy. Um, I just wanted to add a, a note about the, the Han lecture and the format. Um, what, what I really like about it it, this this new format with with two speakers and then um, the the main Han lecture is that it really pays tribute to Lewis Han's vision, uh, the Library of Living Philosophers and and how that unique book series worked. Where you're, those of you who I'm sure most people are familiar with it, but um, each volume in the Library of Living Philosophers was dedicated to um, a, a well known uh, living philosopher and. Each, uh, each volume contained essays with responses by the, the thinker who was the subject of that volume. And this is a, a, a way to, to sort of continue that legacy of, of, of Lewis Hahn's vision for the Library of Living Philosophers, I think. Um, so it's I'm, my pleasure and my honor to uh, introduce my friend, uh, Dwayne Tunstall. We go back to our graduate school days here at Southern Illinois University. Uh, Dwayne's now Associate Professor of Philosophy at Grand Valley State University. Um, where he works on African American philosophy, classical American philosophy, uh, especially the work of Josiah Royce and existentialism. Research er interests uh, include the areas of moral philosophy, phenomenology, philosophy of religion, social and political philosophy. Uh, he's written two books. Um, the first is Yes, But Not Quite, Encountering Josiah Royce's Ethical Religious Insight um, from 2009, and Doing Philosophy Personally, Thinking About Metaphysics, Theism, and Anti-Black Racism, uh, published in 2013. He's published a number of journal, journal articles in these various research areas um, and more, um, and his, his full bio can be found on the, the website at AmericanPhilosophy.net. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dwayne Tunstall, whose talk is entitled Curing Black Melancholia with Africana Philosophy. Thank you, Corey, for the introduction. I would like to thank Randy Oxer and Corey McCall for inviting me to be one of the two speakers who will deliver talks honoring the work of Lewis R. Gordon. 
This occasion is especially meaningful to me because Gordon's work has been influential in my own work since I began studying that in 2006. Reading his work, especially his books, Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, Her Majesty's Other Children, Existentia Africana, and Disciplinary Decadence led me to change quite a bit of my dissertation topic. I have been most influenced by his work on the theological suspension of disciplinarity and his existential phenomenological account of anti-Black racism. I met Gordon a year later, which would be 2007, at the 12th annual Lewis University Philosophy Conference on Phenomenon and De um, Decolonization of Philosophy. He was gracious with his time and has been supportive of my work ever since. I will now like to begin my talk proper. I have divided my talk into four sections. The first section will be a brief introduction. The second section will concentrate on describing Afro-pessimism as a symptom of black melancholia. The third section is my description of the cure to this, drawing upon the work of Lewis Gordon. And the final section is just going to be brief closing remarks. Introduction. We currently live in a troubled time when Afro-pessimism seems to be an absurd yet plausible account of Black existence in the United States and elsewhere. It seems absurd because Black people today are not literally slaves. There are even some Black people, including those biracial and multiracial people who identify themselves as Black, who have risen to the highest echelons of Western and Westernized societies. If we restrict ourselves to the United States, Black people are among the most influential people in their fields. Among them are former President Barack Obama, current Democratic Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris, Beyonce, Byron Allen, Oprah Winfrey, and Sean Carter. Yet they reach their status due in large part to them being recognized by white people, particularly well-networked and wealthy white people. What makes Afro-pessimism seem plausible as an account of Black existence is that Black success seems dependent on white recognition, or at least on white people not interfering in Black people's lives. This is a problem for any Black person, such as myself, who does not believe that the meaningfulness of their existence is influenced by white recognition, or at least white non-interference. However, I contend that Afro-pessimism itself is not the problem. It is just the most recent symptom of a disease that many Black people living in Western and Westernized societies have suffered from for centuries. This disease is what naturally Atoka and Lewis R. Gordon call Black melancholia. This disease afflicts Black people who mistakenly believe that their intellectual, social, and cultural contributions are meaningful only to the extent that they are recognized as being meaningful by white people and to white people. In this talk, I propose that Africana philosophy in general and Lewis R. Gordon's philosophy in particular can be um, used to cure this disease. Section two on Afro-pessimism and Black melancholia. I would like to acknowledge that there is an entire book on Black melancholia entitled Existentia Melancholia, The Indispensable Overcoming of the Black Condition, written by Atoka and translated by Bill Hamlet. But I will limit my discussion to Gordon's use of that term. Gordon may not use it that often in his writings, but one can see it as one of its main topics either in his existential phenomenological account of anti-Black racism and his early published writings, which I like to include his published writings from 1995 through roughly the year 2005, or in his ongoing discussions of how Black people throughout the African diaspora have overcome anti-Black racism since at least the 17th century. For Gordon, Black melancholia is, quote, the phenomenon involving the realization by Blacks of being indigenous to a world whose claim to legitimacy is based on their exclusion. 
this experience happens not only within political institutions, but also within other organized forms of power, including static and epistemic life. An example of the latter is the Manichaean readings of black intellectual production in which black intellectuals produce black things, whereas white intellectuals produce universal offerings to mankind. The particularity of the black condition as particular connoted a special kind of failure, whereas white hegemony could remain intact. Unable to affect the universal, the particularity of black thought represented a negative term, eventually to disappear over time in the dustbin of irrelevance." Unquote. Before I discuss black melancholia directly, I would like to describe one of its most rec uh, recent symptoms, namely Afro-pessimism in more detail. I hope by discussing Afro-pessimism, I will provide you with some insights into its root cause and how it can be cured. I would like to begin this discussion by agreeing with Gordon that Afro-pessimism is a black author neolistic intellectual movement. I also agree with them that it is what I would call a passive neolistic intellectual movement. I should note that what I mean by neolism is not quite what Friedrich Nietzsche means by that term. And I have explored what I mean by neolism in an unpublished essay entitled Neolism in African American Christianity Can It Be Avoided? And I would just like to draw upon that unpublished essay for a few minutes so that you can get a better sense of how I would use that term. There are at least two different two differences between how I conceive of nihilism and how Nietzsche conceives of it. First, while Nietzsche's notion of nihilism arose as a response to the social, historical, and cultural milieu in which he lived, especially late 19th century Prussia and later Germany, my thoughts on nihilism were birthed from studying the lived reality of, of those who are identified as racially Black in the United States and more importantly, witnessing some of the detrimental effects of those lived realities on Black Americans. Second, Nietzsche makes use of his conception of nihilism in his apparently deconstructive genealogy of Western morality, as exemplified both in secularized and pietistic Prussia and more specifically Lutheran societies, and the Christian faith, whereas I conceive of nihilism phenomenologically. Stated differently, Nietzsche's genealogical conception of nihilism involves a critique of power and of societal institutions and practices that denies human, and here read Greco-Roman excellence, whereas my phenomenological notion of nihilism seeks to be a faithful description of the motivational structure or lack thereof of persons or groups of people who exist in an occasionally cruel and dehumanizing life world. Yet there is something in Nietzsche's conception of nihilism that could be incorporated into a phenomenological understanding of nihilism, namely his distinction between active and passive nihilism. So when I distinguish between these two forms of nihilism, I am distinguishing between being motivated to act simply as a reaction against the dominant social historical milieu or against someone else, that would be active nihilism, and a lack of motivation in the face of either the dominant social historical milieu or when encountering someone who represents that milieu, that would be passive nihilism. I would characterize Afro-pessimism as an expression of late 20th and early 21st century passive nihilism, which is suffered by mostly educated middle class and rich black people in Western and Westernized societies who feel hopeless living in an anti-black world as Afro-descended people. It is their recognition that they are under the threat of being disposed by vigilantes, police officers, and others at any moment, regardless of their socioeconomic status, education, gender, religion, or sexual orientation. 
This has been illustrated in the publicized deaths of African-Americans in the United States at the hands of police officers and vigilantes. For example, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Eric Gardner, Tamir Rice, and Walter Scott. This is also evident in the continued racial disparities in poverty rates, employment rates, and mortality rates between Afro-descendant people and white people in North America. And I could also include the disproportionate rates of infection and fatalities due to the complication of the COVID-19 between these groups. And you can see how these disparities exist in other places across the globe with histories of colonialism and with a notable number of white people in the population of those places. Interestingly, some Afro-pessimists such as Calvin L. Warren have adopted Gordon's interpretation of Fanon's zone of non-being. Following Gordon, Warren and other Afro-pessimists can claim that there are at least two senses in which Black people can exist in the zone of non-being. First, quote, it could be limbo, which would place Blacks below whites, but above creatures whose lots are worse. Or it could simply mean the point of total absence, the place most far from the light, and a theistic system radiates reality, which would be hell. Unquote. In the hands of Afro pessimists like Warren, these senses of the zone of non being not only become the ways that black Blackness is disclosed in Afro modernity, I might as well go ahead and also say that the way that people who are racialized as Black are disclosed in Afro modernity, but it's also it's going to be how Blackness exists um, simpliciter. This is why Warren, for example, can contend that even after Black people were emancipated in the United States, they were tossed into, as he puts it, quote, a form of hell, a space of ontological terror, unquote. We cannot even use the Heideggerian term translated to English as thrownness to characterize the form of hell Black people occupy since the existential mood of thrownness can only refer to those who are human and not those who exist as the slave. That is to say, the ones who exist only as commodities and available equipments for whites and other non-Black humans to use in pursuit of their projects. Black people cannot ever exist as human and I just want to concentrate that Warren and other Afro-pessimists aren't making a historical or empirical claim here. They are speaking in, on an ontological register. So when I say Black people cannot ever exist as human, they're talking ontologically. And this is going to be so regardless of whatever they do and regardless of whether they are ontic or historical slaves or not. And this is going to be so because Black people are the other that makes it possible for humans to exist in the first place. And as other, Black people live, as Warren would put it, within a, quote, political architecture that relegates Black and here, when Warren writes being, oftentimes he is going to do a strike through through the term. So when I quote Warren, more often than not, imagine being being stricken out as I read the quote. So again, quote, political architecture that relegates Black being outside its structure in a space without clear definition, unquote. And he would go as far as to say that even when Black people make political demands in Western and Westernized societies, they're not in a position to be heard as fully human. In the Afro-pessimist imagination of Western and Westernized political spaces, Black people function as specters haunting the body politic, hiding from ghostbusters who seek to entrap them and 
hermetically sealed chambers, never to be heard from again, or seeking to be like humans by acting like a lovable and personable ghost, such as Casper the Friendly Ghost. Warren describes this phenomenon in more sinister language when he interprets how President Abraham Lincoln appears in a scene depicted in the great American, what is it? Chased by Copperheads, by E.W.T. Nichols, and it was published in 1863. In that scene, Lincoln, as Warren is going to characterize him, quote, is running away from this space, attempting to leave the snakes, the skeleton, the blacks, and the demon behind him. Lincoln symbolizes a white descent into the liminal space. That is just the danger of aligning the black with blackness or attempting to end the metaphysical holocaust, you are cast out of the community. But in this fantasy, blacks are on par with snakes, demons, and skeletons. Through this leveling, blackness, uh, no, blacks are represented as ghost-like figures taking their place alongside skeletons and demons. Specters of democracy, as Ivy Wilson might call it. These ghosts are caught between the worlds of the living and the unliving, biologically functioning but ontologically dead, a form of purgatory awaiting judgment, unquote. And by metaphysical holocaust, Warren means, as he puts it, the systematic concealment, descent, and withholding of blackness through technologies of terror, violence, and abjection. It is the perpetual annihilation of blackness as a form of being and the disclosure of being as being unrelated to blackness and a blackness as non-being. In Heideggerian terms, black people cannot exist in the way that Dasein exists in the world because blackness cannot be anything other than an objectively present absence or a presently available and usable equipment. If we stick with Warren's interpretation of President Lincoln in The Great American, What Is It? We can see how there is a difference between emancipation and freedom. Just because President Lincoln emancipated enslaved Africans in the Confederacy with, a, with his Emancipation Proclamation, okay, I'm just going to note for a moment, I don't view President Lincoln as emancipate and enslaved Africans in the Confederacy, or at least I don't like to frame it that way, because it gives the agency to Lincoln and not to the enslaved Africans and free Black Americans who fought for their freedom. But since Warren characterizes things this way, I'm just going to go with him for the moment. And just because they were emancipated doesn't mean that they were actually free. For Afro-pessimists, Black people can never be free until they no longer need to be recognized as being human to be respected as fellow free persons. This is the case because Black people cannot live in the modern period except as at best homo sapiens existing in a state of terror. They are in that state not because of anything that they have done. They exist in that state for merely being racialized as Black and occupying the ontological role of slave in the modern epoch. They cannot live as genuine agents in history, as free persons, because their successes or even the prospects of success can be easily snatched away through incarceration, redlining, state-sanctioned theft of land, and state-sanctioned violence. In other words, Black people cannot be free in an anti-Black world due to the fact that the conditions necessary for them to be free do not exist in such a world. For Warren and other Afro-pessimists, the idea of a free Black person, and Warren will often just refer to a free Black person as a free Black is a misnomer arising from the absurdity of being aware of one's instrumentality and disposability, yet desiring to transcend being an instrument and disposable in a world that forecloses the possibility for Black people to transcend such things. 
at least ontologically speaking. And this is so even when they have rights and liberties in the ontic world, because again, those rights and liberties can be stripped away by others or an, and by the polity in which they live. We can take Warren's characterization of Afro-pessimism and use it to interpret Black melancholia as living with the disease, and I would add dis-ease, involved with being subjected to ontological terror and at the ever-present possibility of being disposed simply for being what one is. In light of Black melancholia, the world the world cannot help but appear to be an anti-Black one for the one suffering this disease because it reveals itself as an inhospitable world to their desires and yearnings. There's no way to escape anti-Blackness if you suffer from, uh, from this disease. The promise of humanism with the accompanying hope that one will be recognized as a fellow person by other persons is illusory. It is built on a hierarchy of being that either systematically excludes racially black people outright or places them in the category of inferior creatures. In this world, anti-black brutality is commonplace. Black people live in a world where we can watch them and I'm gonna to switch to personal pronoun, us being brutalized or having their or our lives snuffed out on videos posted on social media or in news segments. The world seen through the eyes of those suffering from black melancholia is, as Warren puts it, quote, a world in which black torture, dismemberment, fatality, and fracturing are routinized and ritualized a global sadistic pleasure principle, unquote. In this world, black death becomes a spectacle. And rather than hoping that things will get better, the ones suffering from black melancholia resign themselves to living in a world where there is no way to make it better for black people. From their perspective, political activism, such as voting for politicians who will implement policies that reduce, if not completely eliminate police brutality, is a fantasy. For the political realm is not the place to affirm blackness. It's not even built to recognize black people as human or as fully belonging to the human community. For them, the cynical view is a realistic one given the nihilistic conditions of being Black in Western and Westernized societies over the last few centuries. Section three, the cure. Now that I have discussed both a recent symptom of Black melancholia and Black melancholia itself, I would like to defend the contention that Africana philosophy can not only treat Afro-pessimism, but also cure the underlying disease of Black melancholia. When I first proposed the title of this talk, I had no problem claiming that Africana philosophy can be a cure for the disease of Black melancholia. Then I began to entertain the possibility that Afro-pessimism ought to be considered a mode of philosophizing in Africana tradition, given that it is the result of Afro-descendant writers and thinkers philosophizing about the conditions of Black existence in the modern world. I may disagree with how they philosophize about that condition. However, they are definitely philosophizing about it. That led me to think about how one kind of Africana philosophy may need to cure the symptoms of another kind of philosophizing in the Africana tradition, namely one in which the multiplicity of Black people and their subjectivities are flattened and only the disposability of Black people in an anti-Black world remains. I am not at the point where I am convinced that Africana philosophy needs to cure itself of Black melancholia, yet I realize that I excluded Afro-pessimism from being a part of the Africana tradition because of my own conception of Africana philosophy, which has been influenced a lot by Gortens' work in the field. 
And I define Africana philosophy as a philosophical tradition founded on the writings of thinkers of African descent on the African continent and in the African diaspora from the 16th century onward who have philosophized and continue to philosophize about living in a world where racially white Europeans and North Americans increasingly denied the full humanity of Africana people. And by Africana people, I mean people of African descent on the African continent and throughout the African diaspora. Earlier in the talk, I referred to Africana people as Afro-descendant people. I associate Africana philosophy with thinkers addressing the following themes, and these themes were outlined in Gordon's book, An Introduction to Africana Philosophy. The first theme is that the significance of philosophical anthropology or the philosophical study of the nature of human beings in battling against racism and colonialism, especially for peoples who are colonized, enslaved, or oppressed due to their racial identities. The second theme is the problems of theorizing human reality in Western modernity and its Eurocentric conception of civilization. The third theme is the importance of freedom and liberation as subjects of philosophical reflection, especially for oppressed, colonized, and enslaved peoples. The fourth theme is the significance of questioning how identities are formed as one studies the human species, particularly in an environment where certain human features are deemed to be superior to others. The fifth theme is the emancipating significance of knowledge and the lived reality of its contradictions for peoples. And the sixth theme is the weight of history and the formation of human identities. And since Africana philosophy is centered on these themes rather than on a set of methodologies, it is not reducible to any one of the sociological divisions in academic philosophy, at least as it is currently practiced in the Anglophone world. It is neither analytic nor continental. Practitioners of it can be Marxist, deconstructionist, idealist, pragmatist, Bayesian probability theorists, libertarian political theorists, liberationist ethicists, etc. Just as long as the philosophical inquiries address one or more of the above mentioned themes, especially the first, third, or fourth themes. I still lean towards not wanting to include Afro-pessimism as a part of the Africana philosophical tradition because it does not quite address either the first theme, the third theme, or the fourth theme. Since Gordon's work is representative of Africana philosophy, and since I am honoring his work on this occasion, I will emphasize his approach to Africana philosophy for the remainder of this talk. Gordon's discussions of Black people violently fighting and warding off Black melancholia invoke a lot of Black intellectual and aesthetic productions. For example, novels, autobiographies, essays, articles, monographs, poetry, pamphlets, music, speech, sermons, encyclopedias, journals, newspapers, magazines, academic and professional societies, and archives. These are just some of the means by which Black intellectuals, writers, and artists have combated the tendency of many whites, and I would include other non-Black people, to equate being African with being Black, and then associate both African and Blackness with cultural, political, social, aesthetic, and economic inferiority. He sometimes references these intellectual and aesthetic productions as ways of shifting the geography of reason away from Europe and white people to non-white peoples. And here are three ways I can characterize the cure for black melancholia that can be derived from Gordon's work. First, once 
one no longer associates blackness with being ontologically inferior, then there's no need to have someone's sense of self determinant by anti-black racist people. This is an old cure, but one that has been difficult for, for some educated middle class to rich black people or those black people who aspire to belong to one of those social economic classes to swallow. Second, once blackness is no longer associated with a rich ontology in which black people's existence is reducible to their blackness, or at least a static sense of blackness, people who identify as racially black are no longer affected by the white gaze and its dehumanizing effects. In this case, internalizing white people's objectification of black people into disposable black bodies and accepting the white denials of their subjectivity. Third, once one liberates themselves from caring about what racist people think about us, we can escape the iron cage of your modernity and can fly beyond being. This third way of characterizing the cure to black melancholia is the one I would like to explain in more detail and here I would like to use Gordon's distinction between existence and being. For Gordon, existence and being are not the same thing. Being can be understood as a straight jacket for existence. It immobilizes reality, reifies meanings, and prevents new relationships from emerging in the human world. Or if we want to affirm a pluralism of perspectives and life worlds, we could say human worlds, plural. Here is an example of this distinction that Gordon gives in a recent interview. Physiologically speaking, it does not matter what you eat, quote, as long as you get protein and vitamins, unquote. Yet we want food to be flavorful and bring us joy and we want to commune with others as we eat. By being together with others as we eat, we cease engaging in the mere physiological consumption of nutrients. We have transfigured a biologically necessary act into a meaningful human practice. The issue with black existence is not that one is racially black, rather it is about, it is about not having only the choice but also the option to live in a manner that affirmed one's his own value and dignity, independently of what other people think about Black existence. And this would include fellow Black people who have adopted anti-Black racist attitudes and practices. Black aesthetics and the art created by Black artists are just some of the means by which Black people affirm their right to exist, or their right to live in the world. From the perspective of those who philosophically investigate the meaning of Black existence in a non-racist or even anti-racist manner, what it means to be Black, Gordon's going to put, quote, it's linked to the questions of liberation, to the liberation of humankind, unquote. It is to take seriously the political nature of blackness, but not as an instrumental, but not in an instrumental governance sense. That would be thinking about blackness in the register of being, but in an existential sense of being uh, building meaningful worlds where people live with one another. Given how blackness has unfolded in the Americas the African continent and other places throughout the African diaspora over the last few centuries, it has disclosed something important about human existence in general, that human life is about the production of meaning and the truth that, as Gordon puts it, there is no point of being alive if being alive is meaningless. The best of Black existence embodies what John Paul Sartre sought to disclose at the end of being in nothingness when he speculated on how a fundamental project would be lived by people if we could move from ontology to ethics.
from desiring to be a being in itself for itself, namely God, to being authentically with one another. It is to think of reality as what exceeds what has been the case and what is currently the case. It is to transcend being objectified and striving to express one's freedom even in oppressive conditions, in slave revolts, in labor strikes, sitting in segregated lunch counters to protest unjust laws, at marches and rallies, in peaceful protests against police brutality. It is also to disclose the creative potential of failures to open avenues for a better future. It is to disclose reality as the realm of meaning and relationships that is active participation in one's world. It is also a clue to how human creation of meaning is more important than the question of being. And I would add the question of the meaning of being and how people are historical actors who can take up their responsibility for creating a future where subsequent generations of human persons can flourish. Once we can distinguish between, on the one hand, blackness as a reification of one's existence based on the objectification of black bodies and the denial of black agency by anti-black racists, and on the other hand, living black as an agent whose actions create history and the conditions of possibility for people in the future to live freely, people suffering from black melancholia can let go of their mistaken self-conceptions, or at least they can investigate why they relate to reality in the way that they do. Stated differently, they can question who they are and why they act in the way that they do. They can also question their allegiance to a kind of purity, or if I wanted to put this in technical terms, I would say race essentialism, in which being black is one kind of thing and that thing is being other than human. They can realize that our world is not reducible to a black and white one. And Gordon has pointed out in a recent um, video for our Brainwaves video anthology that we live in a world where we can be more than one thing simultaneously. And I love the example that he gives of the concrete significance of the view of rejecting race essentialism. Many people would look at Gordon speaking and say that there is a black man speaking. However, his identity is more complex than simply being a black man. He is also a black Jewish man. But he notes how some people want to deny that he could be black and Jewish simultaneously. But he notes that someone is 100% Jewish if their mother is Jewish and someone can be 100% black if one's his parents are or could be racialized as black. Percentages, he reminds us, do not work as ways of understanding who someone is because someone can be 100% of more than one thing or that they can belong to more than one social group simultaneously. So what this leads us to is the view that blackness can function as a heuristic for what we can call a social ancestry and set of heritages associated with specific ethnic groups whose members have been racialized as black. In this sense, blackness primarily means what Tommy Shelby calls thin blackness and we who are dark and can be conceived of as being similar to what Lionel K. McPherson means by the idea of social ancestry in his article, Deflate and Race. And McPherson gives the example, quote, black Americans constitute an African identified social ancestral black subgroup. And what I would 
like to do is just make what McPherson more specific and say that by Black American, he actually means American descendants of slavery or individual who have been racialized as Black who have ancestors who are either free Blacks um, during a period before the end of slavery and before the Civil War, or they were enslaved Africans, or the ancestors were enslaved Africans. Yet within this subgroup, there are individuals with a multiplicity of identities, nor would this social ancestral subgroup exhaust all of the different ways that people can be Black. I would not go as far as Henry Louis Gates Jr. goes and contend that there are as many different ways of being Black as there are Black people, yet he is right that there is no one authentic way of being Black. And none of these ways of being Black require one to be other of the human. Section four, closing remarks. The cure to Black melancholia offered by Gordon's approach to Africana philosophy is to affirm the humanity and agency of Black people, people, even as we Black people live in a precarious world where there is an ever-present danger of becoming disposable bodies. It is to say that the ontological category of being is probably not a good one for thinking about Black existence, but not because Blackness is a metaphysical nothing nor because it is non-being or being the other of humans, is to reject the nihilism and cynicism associated with the resignation of the ones who suffer from Black melancholia. With respect to Black people, it is to affirm that we exist in the same way that all other humans exist namely as actional beings who acts of creating meanings and invest in objects with meaning are the foundations of human history. We were never ontologically inferior to anyone else in the first place. Okay, I admit that this is not going to be enough for committed Afro-pessimists who no longer believe in things such as freedom, liberty, and equality in our contemporary world. Nor do they think that these ideas are going to be enough to help Black people, especially younger Black people, deal with the status quo in which, as Warren has put it, quote, a growing number of mutilated, violated, and dead Black bodies littering the political field, unquote but they cannot deny our agency even as they preach that Black agency is illusory. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, anyone has a question? Uh, I'm about to switch to the Brady Bunch view here so that I can see a maximum number of people. Um, anyone? Oh, Jerry has a question. All right, uh, Jerry, uh, you need to unmute yourself. Actually, no, I was clapping. Oh, oh, that wasn't, oh, you weren't raising your hand. Okay, all right. Anyone else? Well, I, I'll break the ice, if I may. Uh, can everyone hear me? I hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, I have a comment to make about Duane's wonderful paper. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to ask him a question. Uh, Duane, what year did you say was the conference at which you met Lewis at I Lewis wanna, University? I wanna say 2007. 2007. Uh, that was actually the second conference at Lewis University. Oh, okay. uh, with Lewis Gordon. Uh, by that time, I had already retired, but uh, earlier, um, I don't know if Lewis remembers the date, it was the, the late uh, 90s or early 2000s, uh, we had a conference. I was the chair of the department at Lewis University then called Existence in Black, 
was our first Lewis Gordon conference. And uh, I'm delighted to hear that uh, you were present at the second one and met Lewis there. Uh, so uh, my comment is this. Um, your paper is really superb, so rich, rich, rich. And I'm fascinated by the fact that you adopted the language of cure. Uh, I, I think it's useful and meaningful <clears throat> that you did that, um, that you can see Lewis's work as a sense curing or at the very least helping um, someone with uh, black melancholia to uh, rise out of it or find a new way to think and to live through Lewis's work. Um, <clears throat> in a certain sense, the presentation I'm going to make at uh, four o'clock is a sort of a follow-up uh, on what you have done, as you will see. Um, I discuss some similar themes, but with some additions and differences to the things you have said. Uh, one question I have is, and, and again, um, this is in no way a critique, it's just something I'm curious about because your, your presentation was so rich in ideas. I'd love to have a copy of it so I can okay. study it. Um, but, um, you talked about Lewis's existential um, perspective, uh, which is, of course, uh, a vital aspect of his work and his thinking. Uh, I'm wondering what you uh, thought about or how you see the fact that he calls his perspective existential phenomenology or at times, phenomenological existentialism? Oh, this is something that I have thought about since, I can tell you the month, January 2006. What would it mean for your work to be an example of existential phenomenology or phenomenological existentialism? And what I've been able to, to gather is that when you do phenomenology in that way, you start from the lived experiences of people in the world without having to do a full-blown epoche. You start with how people are living in the world, and then you take a step back and start thinking about how is it possible for those people to live in the ways that they do in such a manner where it is meaningful to them, as well as the relationships that they have with other people, which also shapes how what they do acquires meaning. Interesting, Duane, interesting. Um... Thank you. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your lecture. Um, I'm wondering whether because you could tell me if, if uh, black melancholy uh, influences the extent to which uh, blacks will engage in activism on their own behalf. Uh, could you be a little more specific? Are you talking about all black people in general or are you just- Yes, in general, who? in general. It's a general question. Uh, okay. I am thankful that most um, black people on the ground are not suffering from black melancholy. Because if you took it seriously, then you would view any political activity you engaged in from a cynical lens. You may do it, but you're not doing it because you believe that you can change the world, maybe not for yourself, but for future generations. You would 
do it more for example careerist reasons and purposes. You would see that this is the new thing and then you can benefit from doing it. Or you will do it because, oh, I can, I can read well. I like being a scholar. I like talking about ideas and people are willing to listen to me talk this way. So the way that I will um, want to answer your question is by first saying that if a large majority of people who identify themselves as racially black or who have been racialized as black actually suffered from this disease, you wouldn't have had all of the pushback against unjust conditions and treatment of black people. All right. Hi, Duane. Um, Hello. Yeah, thank you. That, as, as Marilyn said, that was a wonderful presentation. And um, one, um, there, there are so many um, elements. Um, part of the discussion I had, I had um, mentioned uh, uh, when in the exchange that in my work I make, I actually argue the long debate between existentialism and phenomenology is actually a false dilemma. And that, and that ultimately, that's one of the reasons why I often say existential phenomenology or phenomenological existentialism. And there are lots of detailed reasons why I take that position. But in terms of the specific uh, discussion you just um, made, uh, I wonder uh, also one of the things you may notice that one of the uh, problems I also have with the Afro pessimists is that by ontologizing black people, they defend a kind of reductionism that actually degrades other kinds of people. And by that, I mean specifically indigenous peoples, Native Americans. And I was wondering if you could say something in terms of what you've read in their work, in terms of how they talk about Native Americans. Oh, um, Lewis, I am sorry, but I had to reconnect so I miss most of your question. No problem, Duane. The short, the short version of it is, is that given the kind of premise Afro-pessimists build their work on, which is a form of uh, um, reductionism that is actually more radical than Afro, say, Afrocentrists, because Afrocentrists actually don't take the position that, that other groups of people should be uh, degraded or, or should be less. Right. But Afro-pessimists particularly target Native Americans. Uh, in other words, uh, there is an extent, and, and what's, what's ironic about the way they do it is they actually tr attack Native Americans as somehow having access to the discourse on being human and so I was wondering if you want to say something about that. Um, that's an uh, issue that I am still wrestling with, not just from the vantage point of how Afro-pessimists write about and engage in issues of indigeneity, but also in my own work with respect to relationship between racialized black people in colonies or colonial contexts such as the United States in relation between being racially black and being indigenous. I want to say that a lot of it is the inability to make sense of what it would mean to be indigenous and relating to individuals who are indigenous if you view yourself as ontologically slaves. Because even if you are indigenous and you suffer through oppressive conditions, you are still human. You may be a degraded, disrespected human, but you still fit within the system. Being racially black, on the other hand, removes you from the system and 
I think it's even worse than that. For them, it would be to not even be recognized as part of the system. So when you encounter indigenous peoples, there's a, I would say a type of anxiety for, that emerges from that encounter. And it comes out in how various Afro-pessimist writers frames the relationship between whites, blacks, and indigenous peoples. I wish I could give you a more articulate answer than what I've just given you, but I'm still trying to think through this myself. Thanks, Duane. Yeah, part of it was one of the one of the things that's I consider problematic in their work is that they don't make a distinction between integration and assimilation. And because they conflate the two, they they are able to to build certain types of arguments that fetishize exclusion. And um, a good example, for instance, is given their lines of argument, uh, they would not at all be um, either sympathetic or connected to the plight of Dalits. And for those who are not familiar with Dalits, Dalits are basically Blacks of South Asia. And because from their view, those are indigenous black peoples in, it, you know, in South Asia. And of course, this pertains also to indigenous black peoples on the continent of Africa. And one of the things that, but Dalits in their uh, philosophical writings and also their existential writings uh, do make the distinction between integration and assimilation. And what they argue is that Integration is what puts, it is, is brings you under the jurisdiction of a group, but not necessarily the assimilation into the group. So the way Dalits would read, say, India or Pakistan, is that uh, in order when the British left India uh, and then the partition emerged for Pakistan, the uh, Dalits who were not Hindus, Dalits who were, uh, in other words, they're not Bra um, Brahminic. Uh, in order for, and, and as a consequence, Brahmins functioned as a, a minority within the Indus Valley in order for power to be achieved, set a system up in which there could be Dalit rule which required the integration, I'm sorry, Dalit, Brahminic, Brahminic rule, which required the integration of Dalits. But that meant Dalits under their control. But the problem is, in Brahminism, Dalits are untouchable. You see the logic? So they're under a legal jurisdiction that is premised upon their exclusion. And as a consequence, they're listed legally as Hindus though most, most Dalits are not Hindus. But under Hinduism, they could only be Hindus if they are structured as excluded from the system, paradoxically, through being integrated into it. Now, I, I consider the Dalit arguments to be a lot more sophisticated than the Afro-pessimist arguments, because the, the Dalits are not actually pushing the, the, the argument of ontological exclusion, you see? Their argument is that this is a very distinct political phenomenon. And because of that, the way Dalits would argue then is that the issue is to find a way to have a different system through which one is able to articulate the fact, not, not, not the, the, the quest, but the fact that Dalits are human beings, you see? In other words, that logic could only work if and only if Dalits are first and foremost human beings. I, I just wanted to put that okay. out. Okay. So thanks for your talk, Duane. I, I wanted to ask a, a question 
maybe it's an ambiguity or attention that I, that I saw in your presentation of, over the uh, concept of authenticity. And so towards the end of your, your talk, you mentioned Sartre's move at the end of being in nothingness from ontology to ethics, which assumes some notion of authenticity. Yeah. And then after that, right, when you're talking about um, ways of being black, you said that there's no one authentic way of being black. So I'm wondering, and here's the ambiguity, right? Yeah. Does that mean there are many authentic ways of being black or that authenticity isn't a useful concept? It depends on which day you talk to me. Okay. Right now, I would want to say that there are many different ways of being authentically black. I don't want to say specifically how many different ways because I don't want to foreclose any possible way of being black that isn't reducible to sincerity though. I, I am very, very skeptical of moves that people make where they say, I am this thing and I've chosen to be a thing and I'm sincerely this thing. Other days, I just chuck authenticity talk because it doesn't really do much work. And the work that it does is not good to talk for talking about identities. I know that this is going to be a distinction between me and how um, Lewis um, Gordon would put it. Because if I remember correctly, yeah, authenticity talk in the Sartrean sense, we shouldn't do that for Gordon. Other questions? Thomas? Hey, I really enjoyed your talk, Dwayne. Um, Thank you. I wanted to pose, I guess, a, a bit of a terminological challenge and, and to raise a question um, about what you mean by melancholia in particular. And um, I guess the, the motivation for this question is that, you know, in in Freudian psychoanalysis, right, um, melancholia isn't seen as pathological, right? It's not seen as intrinsically a disease, right, or a, a problem for mental health. It's seen as part of the basic foundations of subject formation, such that what we mean by melancholia is a loss that's experienced that then uh, shapes the structures of desire uh, for the, evol the evolving or maturing subject. And so in, in Lewis Gordon's work, I've read the, that concept of black melancholia not as necessarily meaning a disease, um, but as meaning consciousness of inhabiting a world in which the structures of recognition are, are premised on white recognition, right? or the, the structures of desire are oriented by that schema. And so what, what I would want to suggest is that uh, what, you're, what you're diagnosing as a disease is actually a particular orientation to black melancholia rather than black melancholia itself. And um, the, the sort of sketch that I might give might be something like this, that we could first of all distinguish between reflective and pre-reflective forms of black melancholia. So for people who, uh, for people who have the disease as you've outlined it, the typical form would be a form of pre-reflective melan black melancholia in which one inhabits a world that um, premises recognition and desire on, on whiteness um, and one simply tries to live according uh, to those values. Reflective black melancholia would understand that one inhabits such a world and then would have as a thematic issue for it that, that question of how to inhabit um, an anti-black racist world. And given that, we could, we could also then draw a further distinction within that framework of reflective black melancholia. And I think here we could echo the um, passive nihilism versus active nihilism uh, distinction that, that, that you raised. Whereas there might be a form of passive reflective black melancholia in which one says, this is the kind of world that we inhabit. And gosh, that sucks. This is not a great world. And that seems to be the Afro-pessimist direction versus what we might call an active 
form of reflective black melancholia in which you say, this is the kind of world that we inhabit, but that doesn't prevent us from trying to build other worlds. Right? Because we inhabit an anti-black world does not mean then that one must be stuck within the structures of desire and the structures of recognition that, that, it, that, it, uh, that are its foundations. Uh, so I, I was wondering what, if, if you think um, that distinction maybe uh, would be useful to your argument or if it screws up your argument. It wouldn't screw up my argument. It would require me to do more psychoanalytic interpretations of phenomena than A, I'm comfortable doing and B, that, that I think is necessary. Because as, um, as Gordon um, put it in the chat, his understanding of black melancholia is drawing a lot from psychoanalysis, particularly the orientation of loss in an anti-black world. And I want to, to go, yeah, that, that is how he uses the term. But the way that it manifests itself from the vantage point of Afro-pessimist and how it's often taken up is as a disease or a disease. And that was the passive nihilistic sense that I want to explore, the one that needed to be cured. The active form of it isn't something that needs to be cured, it's something that needs to be wrestled with so that you can become more mature. That would be a different paper. I like that idea. If I ever write it, I will credit you. Or you can write it, I can give you a thumbs up. All right. We've got about, we've got a few more minutes before 3.30 Central. All right, well, then it, it would appear that we are done uh, and we have a few minutes before uh, Marilyn is gonna speak to us. I wanna thank our speaker. I wanna thank everybody who uh, attended and the, uh, and the questioners in particular. And uh, we'll resume again in about 40 minutes. <laughs>